So good afternoon. Uh, I'm Lee Jan, Professor of Anthropology and Vice Dean for Social Sciences here at UC Davis. Uh, it's my privilege to welcome uh, everyone here for the eighth Chevron Lecture in Public Policy. Steve Chevron was the Dean uh, of the Social Sciences here from 1998 to 2008, and now the Director of the Murphy Institute at Tulane. Uh, he and his wife, Angeli established the Chevron Lectures in Public Policy with a generous gift uh, to the College of Letters and Science made on the occasion of uh, uh, Steve's retirement from UC Davis. The endowment supports an annual lecture on topics related to the social sciences and public policy that have brought relevance to all students, faculty, and the wider university community. So today, we're also very lucky to have uh, Steve in the audience tonight. <laughs> He's uh, visiting us uh, from New Orleans, where he and his wife now live. Um, so we're very uh, grateful for his support, and we're very happy that he can uh, visit UC Davis today. So over the past nine years, the Chevron Lecture Fund has brought distinguished scholars from across the social sciences disciplines to UC Davis to share their work on topics such as healthcare reform, government secrecy, immigration, polarization in American politics, corporate finance, and poverty. Each of these talks has informed our thinking on the day's most relevant issues of national public policy. Today's lecture, which will focus on evidence-based policy and whether we can expect that it will improve uh, social programs, add yet another important policy attention um, uh, question to the topics that have uh, been covered by the Chevron lectures. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, what our speaker will tell us on this issue. Now, before I hand over to Anne Stevens, who will introduce uh, Mr. Hoskins, uh, I would like to thank the Institute for Social Sciences for organizing and sponsoring this evening's lecture, and also co-sponsorship uh, was also kindly provided by the UC Davis Center for Poverty Research. Finally, I'd like to point out um, the updated Chevron Lecture plaque, which is here, uh, which uh, usually hangs in the Social Science Dean's office, and uh, it bears a record of uh, all the Chevron lectures. So uh, we have added Ron Haskins' name to this distinguished list, so his name will find a permanent home uh, at UC Davis. So now it's my pleasure uh, to welcome Anne Stevens, uh, Professor of Economics and the, the Director of the UC Davis Center for Poverty Research, who will uh, introduce our speaker tonight. So Anne, yes. Thanks, Lee, and break the microphone first. Um, thanks everyone, it's great to see um, such a good crowd, many of my colleagues from economics and the Center for Poverty Research. Also great to see a lot of students here, welcome to all of you. And of course, um, it's especially nice to have Steve Sheffrin here, so glad that he was able to join us. Um, it's really a pleasure tonight to introduce tonight's speaker for me. Um, Ron Haskins is a senior fellow and holds the Cabot Family Chair in Economic Studies at the Brookings Institution, where he co-directs the Center on Children and Families. He's also a senior consultant at the Annie E. Casey Foundation and was the president in 2016 of the Association for Public Policy Analysis and Management. Ron's career path has been um, quite remarkable. Um, he's done many, many different things through the years. Um, I spent some uh, time going over his CV in the last few days. It's quite uh, interesting, more interesting than many of us who have been on the academic path for many years, I would say. Uh, he, um, for example, served in the United States Marine Corps, 
uh, then went on to earn a PhD in developmental psychology. In 1986, he started a 14-year stint at the House Ways and Means Committee uh, and was subsequently appointed to be senior advisor to President Bush on welfare policy. Uh, in 1997, following this period, he was selected by the National Journal as one of the 100 most influential people in Washington, uh, or in the federal government. Uh, this time, uh, 1997, you might recall, was the time of a sweeping bipartisan welfare reform legislation. And so following that, he uh, authored the book Work Over Welfare, the Inside Story of the 1996 Welfare Reform Law. More recently, he continues to be influential and follow policy and, and um, research. Uh, he's co-authored recently a book, Show Me the Evidence, Obama's Fight for Rigor and Evidence in Social Policy, that was published in 2015. Following that, he was appointed by Speaker Paul Ryan to co-chair the Evidence-Based Policy Commission, um, and hopefully he will talk more about that tonight. It's always really an honor and a treat to be in the same room with Ron Haskins. Um, in general, I've found that whenever Ron is in the room, the chances that researchers and policymakers, and sometimes even liberals and conservatives, will actually talk to and listen to each other goes up quite a bit. So on that basis, I think we can all agree we're very lucky to have him here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Haskins. Thank you. Well, it's wonderful to be here on this uh, interesting occasion, and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Sheffrin for establishing this, and uh, I had a chance to meet him and talk just briefly, so that was a very nice uh, thing to do. I didn't realize I was going to have my name on a plaque here, so now I have to figure out a way to get my kids to come here and go in that room, and they say, oh, look at that, Dad. You're... So that's, that's always good, uh, and it's always good that uh, at my age that my kids all still speak to me. It's really amazing. Uh, so I want to talk to you about, about evidence-based policy. Uh, I think this is an extremely important topic, uh, and I've tried to organize this in a way so that I don't assume that you have expertise in any of the things that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to, this is fairly basic, uh, about what's at stake here, what we're trying to do, and whether we're having success. And I want to emphasize, as you'll see in the end, that whether we're going to be successful is not clear. Uh, that's a very important thing to say right off the bat. I'm optimistic. I think this is the best chance we've had to create good government programs that actually have the impacts they're supposed to have. We do not have that now, uh, as I will show you. Now, one of the things that comes up immediately, this has come up, my mother lives in a place called Lambertville, Michigan, and I was there recently, and people asked me, so, Evidence? Would Trump in town? And this is an inevitable question. And so let me start out by, first of all, showing you the depth of the evidence-based movement. Now, that when that person uh, accosted me in my mother's town of Lambertville, Michigan, which has about 50 people, uh, I'd had a glass of wine or two, and I started describing to them what I just referred to as the depth and breadth of the evidence-based movement, and I said that it's raging rivers emptying into a bottomless ocean of knowledge. And, you know, I get a little carried away. But I really feel like that about this. These are, these are all truly remarkable uh, initiatives. All of them are still underway. Almost all of them have been created or changed quite substantially in the last decade. So this is a fairly new movement. And certainly uh, about half of these in the last five or six years have either expanded or been created. I'm not going to try to describe all of them to you, but I'm going to make comments about a few of them, except I can't read, oh yes, right on the screen here, so I can read that. Um, so first, I mentioned the Obama evidence-based initiatives. They are the key. I hope you recognize that that was roughly the title of the book that I wrote about uh, Show Me the Evidence, uh, and I'm going to come back to that, and that will really be the focus of my talk today. I'll spend about half the time talking about it, because I, I think this really holds tremendous promise. I should tell you in the beginning, you probably noticed that I work for President Bush, and this would pretty much eliminate the possibility that I would be a liberal or a Democrat. So that means I'm a conservative and a Republican. Uh, and yet I wrote this book about Obama and said several times in the book that Obama, Bush was a good president for evidence. I know that may amaze you, but he started a number of things that are on this list and other things as well. 
Uh, but Obama, we've never had a president like Obama that was so focused on evidence and improving policies and using evaluation. He funded it. If you look at the report of the president that comes out every year, there are essays in about half of the, his uh, presidential or the economic report of the president about evidence-based policy, and some of those are really good articles. Uh, and he personally, I know for a fact, was involved. We interviewed about 140 people. To, uh, 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 that's a material we used in the book, uh, on the Hill and in the administration who had been involved in one way or another with these evidence-based policies that I'll talk more about in just a minute. And we confirmed, there's no question about it, that Obama was sitting at the table on several occasions going through, I mean, can you imagine, the President of the United States, I'm, it's hard for me to believe, I've been in Washington 30 years, the President of the United States is sitting there talking about evidence and generating more evidence and how you can really use the evidence to make policy choices. So that really was remarkable. It didn't turn me into a Democrat, uh, but it has been an unending source of difficulty with my Republican colleagues uh, because I speak very highly about Obama, and worst of all, I do it in public, and I wrote a book about it. Uh, <laughs> so so I'm, I'm down to two Republican friends, so it's nice to be at a liberal <laughs> university, and I might be able to make some new friends. I'll look forward to that. Um, OMB leadership. Now, this is a, maybe a little sad. Um, Mulvaney uh, is not necessarily highly committed to evidence-based policy, which is such a sharp contrast uh, with the people that were appointed during the Obama years, beginning with Peter or Orzag, who is my colleague at Brookings. Peter had previously headed the, off uh, the um, Congressional Budget Office, which I cannot tell you what a great honor it is and how important it is, because among other things, they score every bill that comes to the floor. So they tell you what its effects are going to be and how much it's going to cost. And it's, believe it or not, in Washington, even with all the partisanship and so forth, CBO is believed. And I think that's one of the reasons, if the Republicans are in power, that the Democrats are very critical in, in, uh, of CBO and vice versa. It's because they know they're right. Uh, and everybody in Washington believes them. And the Washington Post, New York Times, all the papers, they report what CBO says as the truth. And in Washington, this is quite remarkable. And believe it or not, the Office of Management and Budget, which is a crucial, uh, integral part of every administration, they do the President's budget, for example, and write that book I was telling you about a minute ago uh, on the economic report of the President. And they also do a lot of research of their own. They publish information about the effects of programs. And they provide leadership. Are you raising your hand? What did... I, I, I still couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. We, we, someone give this young lady a microphone, will you? Did I say something wrong, or was, are you expanding, or what are you? Uh, okay, well, they're part of the White House, but the, the chapters in there, several of them are written by, uh, by OMB. In any case, thank you for the correction. Um, and in many cases, it's impossible to you know, distinguish clearly between the White House and OMB. They're right in the same building or right next to each other. Uh, so in any case, um, but I accept the correction anyway. So OMB is really, I refer to them repeatedly in the book as the quarterback of the evidence-based movement, and they certainly were in the Obama administration. Uh, so it's a little concerning now uh, that OMB, now, it, like all the government agencies, their career staff and their political appointees, and the career staff, many of them are still there. Some of them may leave, but there's many critical career people there who know about the evidence-based movement and have played a role in it for maybe 10 years. Uh, and so they're still there. So that I think that it will continue to be a very central place uh, of evidence-based uh, policy movement in Washington. Institute of Education Sciences, I urge some of you students to Google Institute of Education Sciences. I'm going to exaggerate a little bit. Uh, maybe this young lady can correct me again. Uh, that the... Research in education was not necessarily all that informative. And Congress created the Institute of Education Sciences, and Russ uh, Whitehurst, who is my colleague now at Brookings, uh, was the first director of it, and he was a fanatic about random assignment studies. And so now we have literally over 100 big random assignment studies, very expensive, on important issues in education. And they have a wonderful... Uh, they have a wonderful website called the What Works Clearinghouse, which has lots of information about these and, and associated um, uh, issues. So that's a really important uh, 
uh, moment in evidence-based policy, and it's had a tremendous impact uh, on research and education, our knowledge about education. And it's in many ways the government agency that mo best illustrates what the, uh, you might even refer, refer to as a culture of evidence in Washington because they generate research, they draw policy implications from the research. A lot of people use their website all the way from students to policymakers, and, and people really trust the, uh, the Institute of Education and Sciences. So that was a great innovation and directly on the issues uh, that are addressed uh, in evidence-based policymaking. The White House social and behavioral sciences team is fascinating. Many, many of you probably have heard of nudges. Uh, this is a psychology essentially started this. In fact, uh, people that started won a Nobel Prize, or one of them did. Uh, and the idea is that people are not rational. What a shocking idea. Uh, and they have ways of thinking that policy could capitalize on and we can improve policy. So a great example is for years, many companies and government did this as well. They would get people to volunteer for important things like uh, retirement benefits. And so you could save, if you would sign up and sign your name, yes, I want to put aside whatever it is. And it turned out that a lot of people didn't do it, even when the company or the government agency matched in some sense. So if you save a dollar, they might give you 25 extra cents for that dollar which helps build up the, well, they discovered that if they made it an opt-out instead of an opt-in, so that you get it, you can get out of it, all you gotta do is check a box and say, no, I don't want it, and you don't have it, and it doubled, tripled, quadrupled the number of people because something like humans are lazy, and they just, you know, they didn't just let it keep going, and the money builds up, so it has exactly the, the effect that it's supposed to have. And there are many other examples of this, uh, UK government agencies, uh, American government agencies, especially at the federal level, some at the state level now, uh, are using these principles of trying to capitalize on the way people think, even if it's not rational, uh, to improve their policies. And indeed, the White House established this, uh, this social and behavioral sciences unit in the White House, and they did the previously unthinkable thing of working directly with agencies across the government and conducting random assignment studies with these agencies on issues that uh, concern them. So for example, the very momentous issue of can you get people to use two-sided copying and save the forest? And they did this with the Department of Agriculture, a year-long study, and they doubled or quadrupled a huge increase in the rate of, of, uh, of two-sided copying. Uh, all the way to, here's one I really like that some of you may even uh, understand this, uh, and that is uh, something called summer melt. A lot of time, as you know, a goal of many high schools and many universities is to try to get low-income kids to go to college. If low-income kids go to college, especially if they get a degree, two-year or four-year degree, it changes the whole, whole future. Well, it turned out that a lot of kids said they were going to go, they signed up, they worked out the financing and everything, and then they didn't show up in the fall. And so the, someone had the idea well, we'll send them messages during the summer, and we'll ask them questions like, have you packed your bags? Do you know what you're going to take? Have you signed all the papers you have signed? Have you elected your courses? And uh, you know, a whole series of things like that. And they found out uh, that that increased attendance at the colleges for these low-income kids by 20% in one experiment. So it really had a big impact. Just this sending messages, you know, you wouldn't think that something like that would have such an impact. And they did the same thing in the services. We're getting people to sign up uh, for, uh, for benefits at the end of their services, very similar to the experiment I talked about before. So a whole range of things like this. At the end of their first year of operation, they published a report, you can get it, it's on the, on the internet, uh, of I think it was 17 all but one random assignment studies, which are you know, the high, gold standard of studies, and almost all of them had impacts. So here's a government agency that gets set up in its first year, publishes, lets the public see exactly what it had done and had great impacts on you know, a range of issues that are from things that were not that crucial to things that really were quite crucial. Uh, so let me skip now all the way down to Annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Science. The issue that they, uh, one of their issues in 2018 will be completely devoted to evidence-based policy and there'll be chapters on almost everything here. The entire journal will be devoted 
uh, to this to evidence-based policy. So I think this is really, to me, it's a it's a kind of a recognition of how important this movement is that a prestigious journal like that is going to devote an entire issue uh, to evidence-based policy and and also to serve as a uh, summary of the pretty much the status of evidence-based policy. So another example of uh, how successful evidence-based policy has been. Results first is an amazing thing. I love this example because it was established 100% by non-governmental funds. It's the Pew, uh, Pew Foundation, uh, Pew Trust, uh, and the um, MacArthur Foundation. They combined their resources, and here's what they did. They got states to sign up for evidence-based activities. I'll tell you about those in just a minute. And 22 states have already signed up, and they've been doing and worked in some of these states for four years. And what they do is essentially a literature review on the evidence on, they pick out an area of social policy, like preschool programs, or maybe delinquency. Uh, and they make a list of all the programs that that state finances, pays for, in that particular area. And then they find out the evidence that those programs works. Well, I hate to tell you this, but most of them have virtually no evidence. Most of them are not model programs that somebody has tested to find out that they really work well. And so the goal is to get, and this really is, this is the single most fundamental thing in the evidence-based movement, I'm going to come back to this, talking about what Obama tried to do, and that is get government to stop spending money on programs that don't work and use the money to spend on programs that do work. And that's what Pew is doing in 22 states. Uh, I know some states have made some very important changes, including Mississippi in one case, uh, which I'm hoping to work with them uh, in the future about a similar project where they're going to spend new money on something that has strong evidence of success. So it's the basic idea, spend the money where it'll do the, have the biggest impact, and we know from, uh, from good evidence that these programs will have impacts. So I'll come back and talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, I want to point out that uh, I, um, Ann mentioned the Evidence-Based Policymaking Commission uh, that I was fortunate to be appointed to. It has 15 members. Uh, and in Washington, despite all you read about the partisanship and so forth, uh, we have met, uh, we've met seven or eight times so far, and we've had numerous phone calls, and we're going to produce a report, and the goal of the report, from our perspective, when you look at the original statute, this is consistent with the statute, and I know you'll all be really excited about this, and that is that we want to make sure that big federal data sets, big data, as some people say nowadays, are easy to access by researchers and program managers. You would not believe how difficult it is to get access to a, a number of big data sets. And those data sets contain tons of information that we can turn into program evaluation and all kinds of very good research. Some of you here may know about uh, Raj Chetty, for example. This is a great example of what we have, can learn from these data sets. So if we can make them easier, uh, more available to researchers and make it so that they can combine across data sets and use information from both from two or more data sets at the federal and state level. It will make it, it there's so much knowledge in those data sets, it'll be a wonderful thing. And they just sit there. Uh, and it's hard to get access to them now. So we're going to try to improve that. And it's especially interesting to me that Speaker Ryan and Senator Murray, a Republican and Democrat, thought this up. And they could immediately see how important this was. And they passed legislation that was approved unanimously in both houses. Money was appropriated, and now we're well into it. We'll publish our report the first week in September. And Ryan and Murray have already, uh, they've checked with us repeatedly through their staff, and we're going to have a release event for the report. Uh, and they're both going to be at the release event to bring attention to the report. <clears throat> and some of the things that we recommend will require new legislation, so they, we're going to help them write the legislation, and I think it will make a big difference. So that's an, yet another example. Uh, so all of these are great examples. I just want to start out by telling you that this movement is live and well, and the answer to the Trump question uh, that I always ask uh, in Lambertville, Michigan, is even if Trump wanted to do something to damage this movement, which is not clear that he does. I don't think it's clear at all that he does. In fact, I, my prediction would be indifference. Uh, the, the, the movement is flourishing and it will continue to flourish. It may not, it certainly will not grow like it did under Obama, because Obama was focused on, and he had many people in his administration, uh, in both the White House and Office of Management Budget, uh, who were, and uh, other agencies that were focused on it. So it's alive and well, it's growing, and it will continue to grow, and it cannot be stopped by man or God. 
Now, here's a first fact to begin with about why this movement is so important. 90% of 10 respected and popular social programs, Head Start and several others, when first evaluated by big random assignment studies, were shown to fail. So roughly 9% of these programs failed. And I mentioned before about the National Institute of Education Scientists funded these big random assignment studies of, of education practices and entire intervention programs like reading and so forth. And 90% of those first 90 experiments that they funded either produced a modest impact or no impact. So we found out again, just like in the study I mentioned about the 10 uh, popular programs that were evaluated, that about 90% of the programs fail. There's a magnificent book, and if, if you take anything away from this lecture, I hope it will be, you will get this book. It's called Uncontrolled by Jim Manzi, uh, and it's about the history of random assignment studies in social science, in medicine, and in business. And he himself established a company that does random assignment studies for business. Uh, um, I'll give you an example of one of the studies they did. Uh, some, you know, uh, Subway is a uh, franchise operation. And someone in the California, in the California franchise had the idea of a $5 footlong. And I'm sure most of you have heard about this. I've eaten about 10 of them myself. So, uh, well, the, the person who owns uh, the president of Subway didn't particularly like it. He thought it was going to damage her bottom line. So he got Mansi to do a big random assignment study on what the impact on the bottom line was. And here's what happened. It turned out that the president was right, that the, the, the uh, offices or the uh, facilities that used a $5 footlong that went into $5 footlong actually made a lower profit margin on the $5 footlong than the, than the, uh, than the uh, companies that sold it for full price. But guess what? People who, more people came in. They sold more units, but they just didn't have the profit margin. And the people that came in bought uh, various drinks, they bought cookies, and they bought chips. And the profit margin on all those is extremely high. So the bottom line was that they made more money uh, because they had the $5 foot loan, get the customer in the store and watch them spend. And so they made more money. So there are a lot of applications in business. Uh, Jim sold his company recently for a modest price of something like $465 million uh, to MasterCard. And they are now conducting, I think the last I heard, they conduct something like 8,000 studies a year on crucial questions like, do we get a better response rate if we send this out in a blue envelope or a red envelope? Uh, and they actually have data on that. And then, but there's some much more important questions. So this idea of gathering evidence in, in, in very good experiments and finding out, getting the answer to practices and policies that you want to implement is really a profitable thing to do, and business is doing it more than any other uh, part of our society. And I think hopefully that is convincing a lot of people that the bottom line is what really counts and it will make a big difference. Uh, so despite all those failures that I talked to you about, there are programs that succeed. I don't want anybody to go out here and say, Haskins says nothing works. There are programs that work, and some of them are quite remarkable. Uh, and if you go back to the first page and all the things I told you about evidence-based movement, many of the, uh, of the components of the movement are developing policies that, and then showing that they work. So here's just an example. I could have picked any number, but these are really interesting studies. The random assignment, uh, they show fairly substantial impacts, and in many cases, the in, impacts replicate. Uh, so you can do it one place, it works. Do it somewhere else, and it works. And this issue of replication, as you'll see in just a minute, is really... A, a crucial part of evidence-based policy. Um, but we still have to deal with these high failure rates, uh, and we face them everywhere. Most education interventions do not work, as I've suggested. Uh, most of our social policies just do not produce the impacts. And not only that, Orzag said when he was the head of the Awesome Management Budget, budget that we know about less, about the impacts of less than 1% of federal spending. So we don't even know what these impacts are. We spend billions and billions of dollars on programs. One of my favorite examples is Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. We spend about $15 billion a year, and until recently we had almost no information on whether it had any impacts. So the government is full of programs that we just, we don't know if they work. And of course, one of the ideas of politics is that you ought to produce results for taxpayers 
Uh, we tax them. We ought to make sure that we can produce results uh, for the money that they give to the government, but we don't. And that's a, a, a major focus of the evidence-based movement. Now, why should we worry so much about these high failure rates? Obviously, the big, biggest answer is it's because our investments, so-called, are wasted. The programs don't produce impacts, and we continue to spend money on them. Think of that $15 billion a year in Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So that's the first a very important impact. The second is that program operators might try to avoid uh, evaluation in the future. This is really a big issue. Now think about this. We have thousands, literally, of programs in the United States that are developed at the local level. I guarantee it. You have a bunch of them here in, uh, uh, in Davis. They're all over the country, little programs, and programs like Head Start started out as little programs and little sites somewhere in you know, rural Mississippi. And they pour their heart and soul into these programs. They raise the money to do the programs. And then someone comes along and says, well, we've got to evaluate this thing and find out if it works because they're trying to get government money. And it turns out it doesn't produce the impacts. So now are we going to say, oh, well, if it doesn't produce impacts, we shouldn't spend the money on that program anymore. And I think the answer has got to be no. And I'll show you more about this in a few minutes when I give you an example, a broad scale example of what we're doing as a nation to improve these programs under, uh, that were developed in the Obama administration. We've got to say, okay, you have to fail to succeed. So now you need to change elements of this program. You've got to figure out new things. You need more training. The program needs to last longer. You need to involve the parents. There could be any one of a number of things that you need to do to improve this program. We're not going to cut your money until you continue to fail. If you fail twice or three times, then we may cut your money. But we're going to stick with you for a while. I think that's really important. And as you'll see in a minute, we have programs all over the United States right now that are being evaluated that aren't producing impacts, and it would be a big mistake to stop spending the money because the program operators will learn to hate evaluation. They won't agree to evaluation. And if they don't agree to it, they control their own program. So we won't, we won't be able to evaluate and we'll be stopped right at the, one of the initial steps. Policymakers also don't like evidence that programs fail. One thing that politicians like to do is claim that they're spending money wisely, and especially on appropriations committees. You see this in Washington and in state capitals. And so they don't want to find out that all this money that they're spending doesn't work. So we got to improve the programs and show, well, first year might not have worked, but second, third year we figured out things to do, and, and, and they, we can make these programs work. Um, a big threat, policymakers and allies might try to reduce or eliminate the program's funding. This is one of the greatest threats of all because Democrats really suspect that the reason Republicans like evidence-based policy is that they're going to use the money to cut the programs. And lo and behold, if you go back and look at the when, uh, when, when uh, Trump released his 2017 budget, not 2018, but 2017 budget, and Mulvaney and they recommended all kinds of huge cuts. And Mulvaney said, these programs don't work, so we got to cut them. This is exactly the wrong, I think, the wrong thing to do. Uh, I wrote about this several places, and my colleagues and I both wrote about it, uh, that it's unwise to say if you, we do one evaluation, we show the program doesn't work, then we're going to cut the funding. We just we can't do that. Uh, and we, above all, we cannot make program operators and politicians think that this is just a way to cut programs and save money. If, if that becomes the hallmark of the evidence-based movement, it will be a short-lived movement. Um, and then, of course, my greatest concern is that if we continually show that programs fail and we can't improve them, make them better, make them have impacts, then the whole evidence-based movement is going to go down the tubes. So a lot of reasons to be concerned that these programs do not work, and we know that uh, because of good evaluation studies that most of the programs don't work. So along comes Obama, and he has an idea that was developed at OMB um, by Orzag and his lieutenants, including a guy named uh, Robert Gordon, who was more or less the head of this movement. Uh, and I'm sure you're all very curious about this, so you should rush right out and buy a copy of Show Me the Evidence, and you'll be able to read all about it and what these people were like and how why they were working so hard and so forth. So the idea that I've already said several times, and this is really the heart of the evidence-based movement, is spend federal grant dollars on evidence-based programs that have been shown to work. If we could do that, not all of them would work, as you'll see in a few minutes, but many more would work than work now. 
And then the second thing is, we have to continue to innovate. If anybody thinks that we've developed all the good social programs we can develop, they're just wrong. We can think of new things to do, more effective things to do. Every year there are five or six or ten new pro uh, programs that I even that I find out about that are that show great promise and that produce impacts on everything from preschool education to delinquency to college attendance to keeping kids in college to helping kids not borrow too much money. A whole range of social issues that could have real impacts. So we always have to leave room for innovation. In other words, all policies are not going to be evidence-based because we want to try new things that we don't know if they work because we've got to have a constant uh, infusion of new programs and new ideas uh, to, and then test them and, and make them become evidence-based. Roughly speaking, this approach, and Obama used this phrase himself, is more money for more evidence. That's the essence of the movement. So now let's talk a little bit more about this tiered uh, evidence approach. It applies to many social domains. Obama himself developed six separate social policies and passed them, having to do with everything from training and employment programs to education programs to teen pregnancy prevention programs to something called home visiting programs that I'll talk more about in a few moments. Um, and then if we're going to have evidence-based policy, this is, this is really important, we have to know what it means to be evidence-based. And so the administration, one of the most important things it did was develop a whole range of ideas about how to say, yes, this program is evidence-based. If, if you read literature now, you'll see that almost every company, when they market a new education program, they say it's evidence-based. That doesn't mean they actually know it's evidence-based, but they say it's evidence-based. So how can we really tell? How can we know if it truly is evidence-based? And roughly speaking, the answer is that we've conducted high-quality evaluations and shown that the program produces impacts. So what the administration did in, in two of the cases of these six evidence-based programs, teen pregnancy prevention, I'll talk more about in just a minute, uh, and home visiting, is that they hired the Mathematica uh, company, which is a very good research company and program evaluation company, and they went through the literature in the case of teen pregnancy prevention, 10,000 different studies they looked at, most of them were junk, and they found every model program that had strong evidence, usually from random assignment studies, that they produced significant impacts on sexual behavior, on teen pregnancy, and so forth. And if they could show in a, high, a study that was judged to be high quality that it produced a range of impacts, and in a study I'm going to show you in a minute, to seven different outcome variables, then they were considered evidence-based. And so now the administration says, if you want our money, we got $100 million for teen pregnancy prevention, and if you want to get some of it, you have to be using an evidence-based policy. That means one of these programs that we've identified as evidence-based. So this is, a, I think it's a very good idea. It has worked well in at least three or four different programs already. There's some problems with the way they make the determination in seven space, and I'll come back and talk about that in a minute. But the general approach, I think, is a way to go, and the administration developed it. Uh, and again, I've said several times now about you've got to leave room for innovative programs that are not necessarily evidence-based in the beginning, because we always have to have new ideas and new, new programs coming along that we can find out if eventually they're evidence-based. And then I mentioned the culture of, that we're trying to instill here, but not just in Washington, but in local programs. And continuous improvement is a concept that's really a crucial part of the evidence-based movement. So the idea is, even if we can produce significant impacts on one outcome, maybe we could make a much bigger impact. Maybe we could make an impact on a big range of outcomes. So program managers, program operators should have it in their mind that they're always trying to improve their programs, or use an evaluation to find out if the program is producing major impacts, and if it's not, they need to change it. And even if it is, they can improve it. They can do new things. So, and some of these are in some of the programs that Obama funded, like Teen Pregnancy Prevention, have annual conferences, and they come together to talk about what they are doing to produce evidence-based programs, and exchanging ideas, and improving their programs based on other people's experience. So continuous evaluation is really, and program improvement is a crucial concept here. And then, in order to make this work, you have to have competitive grants. You cannot do it with formula grants. So formula grants, I think, are just, I wish they were a thing of the past. Because in a lot of programs, politicians want to bring the bacon home. You probably all heard that phrase. And they can't be sure they can do it unless the money is distributed based on a formula. 
So every state gets a certain amount of money, and then in the state they divide it up among the counties based on population or number of poor people or something like that. Well, there's no competition. So how can you, how can you build in this idea of evidence-based policy if you automatically give them the money away based on some formula? So this is a very important part of the approach, and uh, the Obama administration used it with all of these six evidence-based in initiatives, is you had to be applying for money to do evidence-based programs, otherwise you didn't get the money, so formulas are out. And this puts a real, I know there are many people in this room that have served on federal review panels, this puts a real burden on review panels, because they've got to make sure that the goal of the administration to make sure the best programs out there in the countryside that are have the best evidence that they produce impacts, they're the ones that get the money. It's not based on politics, it's not based on influence, it's based on the performance of the programs. And a number of panels are this way, but I'm always nervous about it. I've been on many panels myself, and I would not necessarily say they all made the right decision. I think there are lots of influences other than just a strict look at the evidence. So I'm somewhat concerned about this. We need better panels to make sure the money goes to the right places. And I wanted to show you something to show you what's at stake here. These are just some programs, or many other programs. These tend to be big programs in a whole range of areas, all of which have been around, some of them have been around for 50 years. And we spend way over $200 billion on these programs. And there's very little evaluation in these programs. So my point is that we are now spending billions and billions and billions of dollars in all of these areas of social policy, and we just don't know if the programs work. So that's a major goal, that's part of the Obama administration's intent, was to make sure that the federal agencies require evaluation. And in fact, let me tell you a footnote here, which is really interesting. The Bush administration, I mentioned that they were focused on evidence as well. They created, uh, they created a program that OMB created, a quarterback of the evidence-based movement, and they implemented it in many agencies, and they made the agencies state the goal of every program that they were admit responsible for, and they tried to get them to collect evidence of the impacts of these programs, uh, called a Program Assessment Rating Tool, PART. And they actually implemented, Obama went to the Evans Space Initiatives and didn't continue the same thing, but it may start again in the Trump administration. And the goal is to make sure that the federal agencies which are administering these programs actually require evaluation and, and learn to help uh, help their projects around the country evaluate their programs. So it's a very, very important part of the uh, evidence base initiative that, as developed by the Obama administration. Now let me clarify one thing that I think it, uh, this will be easy to understand, I think, it's, but it's a really a crucial point. Um, a lot of people think of the best thing you can do in Washington is to convince the Congress to create a new program and spend more money on the new program, as opposed to make sure that we're spending the money that we have now more wisely. And that is the goal of evidence-based policy, the latter, not the former. So the Obama approach focuses on implementing good programs, spending the money on evidence-based programs, and then scaling those up to more and more sites. That's the focus of the thing, not to necessarily to create a new program in legislation, it's to spend the money wisely. And if we could do that, we're doing this in some places now, there's what you might call a virtuous cycle of implementing evidence-based programs, evaluating the outcomes, improving the outcomes based on that evidence, continuous evaluation and continuous improvement, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, and then spending additional money on the programs that work. And in fact, we have managed to convince both the Congressional Budget Office and the Office of Management and Budget to issue statements that if there's evidence that a program works, that they will, I, somebody asked me a question if you don't get this, because this is really interesting. They will score the program as saving money. So think of this, if we, let's say, I'm gonna use a simple example, let's say we're gonna spend a billion dollars on teen pregnancy prevention. And let's say that there's provisions in there that they have to be using evidence-based programs, and there's good evidence that these evidence-based programs produce outcomes that would save money. So if you reduce teen pregnancy, you save money. Just on the birth alone, you save a lot of money. Medicaid pays for almost all teen pregnancy uh, births. So if you could show that, then when CBO scores the cost of the program, they subtract the savings from the cost. So let's say it costs, I said just a minute ago, a billion dollars. So now it turns out that it's gonna save money, 
So we're going to save, I'm making this up, but $200 million based on good studies that show that these teen pregnancy prevention programs produce these outcomes. So now instead of costing a billion, it costs $800 million, and we can have a lot more programs. So this is part of the virtuous cycle that we could establish. And if you think this is theoretical, CBO already did it once. They did it in Obamacare. Obamacare had a, uh, a special set of provisions having to do with home visiting, the program I talked about just a few minutes ago. And we have several very, very good studies, especially ones uh, conducted uh, by um, home visiting. This is a... David Olds, thank you very much. I've only known the guy for 30 years. David Olds, Family Nurse Partnership, and very strong studies, big studies, conducted in different places, possible to replicate it. And so they actually scored savings because the first provision that was in Obamacare was it had to be David Olds' program. Well, guess what happened? This is the way Washington works. There is an interest group of home visiting programs, about 15 of them. Well, what do you think they thought about this provision that was in guaranteed money, but only if you're using the David Olds Family Nurse Partnership Program? And so they opposed it, and they really influenced the Congress, and the provision was dropped. As you probably remember, Obamacare went through a whole bunch of drafts. Uh, and so it was, it, there were options, and you could use other programs so CBO would not score it that way anymore. So this is proof positive that CBO would do it, they released a letter to this effect, and so did the Office of Management and Budget. They would score it the same way. If you can show that the program saves money, you get a credit for that, and you could spend more money because you're saving money with at least part of the money. So it's, it, we could have this, what I'm calling a virtuous cycle. So now I want to talk about the teen pregnancy prevention program. Let me just give you some background on the program and then show you the results. And I'm, I have to tell you from the very beginning, this is the best example we have so far of the success that we can expect from evidence-based policy. I think we can improve it. I don't think this is anything like the final chapter, uh, and I think the results are somewhat discouraging, but it's a great approach that we have taken. So there are Tier 1 and Tier 2 programs, 102 grantees in Tier 1, uh, about $70 million a year. I told you before, it's a total of about $100 million, 84 grantees in Tier 2, um, and then there are about $7 million that we used to administer the program. And I'm not going to talk anymore about this, but this is really a crucial part in the first time we discovered this. How the program is administered and what the federal agency does to help local projects and teach them about evaluation and help them improve their programs is so critical. And I, don't, I think most people didn't understand how important that is, so we got to, that's another whole thing that we have to learn about and develop. Here's the diversity of the programs, the relationship education, where you focus on the relationship the kids have with each other and respect and uh, Actual, they sometimes even practice how you, young ladies can say no and guys can take no for an answer. Um, Clinic-based programs, which are primarily about birth control and, uh, and, and the mechanics of uh, pregnancy. Uh, special populations, so this would be teens who have already had a baby. Second babies are a big problem in teen pregnancy. Uh, a young girl who's had one baby has had a much higher probability of having another baby, and so working with them is that considered a special population. Absence education, there's a, this is a big fight between Republicans and Democrats. The Republicans don't think we should do any of these other programs that ought to be absence only, and we tell the kids, just say no, that's it, and teach them how to do that. Um, youth development, these are really interesting and probably the best set of programs that produce the biggest impacts. And the idea is if you can get kids involved in constructive activities in their community, that that is one of the best ways to get them to think about the future and to make sure that they don't get pregnant so they can continue their education and so forth. And some of these programs have been quite successful. And then sex education, which is basically plumbing, how it all works. And uh, these are often regular parts of school curriculum, somewhat boring, and uh, according to many people that I've talked with. So that's a range of programs that were in the teen pregnancy prevention. Now get this, this is really interesting. Here's the ethnicity uh, and age. Look at this, 74% were 14 or younger of all these programs that I told you about a minute ago. Only 18% were 15 to 16 and 8% 17 to 19. So this raises a big issue of doing evaluations because if at the end of a year a kid is 15, the probability that they will have gotten pregnant is pretty low. 
And so that's the most important outcome. So you need to come back a year later or two years later. So this raises some real issues. You'll see this when I show you the data in just a few minutes. Uh, and it was pretty well distributed, uh, black, Hispanic, and white. The biggest problem is among blacks and Hispanics, so the percentage of people is higher there, and that's a, appropriate, I think. Um, so those are the people that were in the programs. The program achieved a lot of things before we even get to the impacts on pregnancy. There's 6,100 new facilitators trained, 3,800 community partnerships established, 66 manuscripts published, 1,292 national and regional state presentations delivered, and the American Journal of Public Health, which is a really high-quality journal, devoted almost a whole issue to the results of the evaluations that I'm going to tell you about in a minute. In fact, yeah, in one minute. Here's some more achievements. 95% were implemented as intended. This, this whole idea of implementing the program as it's designed is really crucial. If you don't, if you're not maintaining fidelity to the original model, you're not going to produce the outcomes. 92% of the sessions were implemented with high quality. They had all kinds of measures where they had direct observation of the classes. And then youth attended 86% of the sessions. I can tell you, having studied community-based programs for years, probably the single biggest problem is attendance. Getting people to actually come is often a complete failure. I know of one program that spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on this program in Louisiana, and the idea of the program was promoting marriage. This was during the Bush administration. The average participant in one of the in a site in Little Rock, Arkansas, the average participant, participant got 15% of the curriculum. Well, think of the public schools. If you were there 15% of the time, how much would you learn? So this attendance is really a big issue. And here, they really that's one thing that they really did very well. A lot of it was because they did it during the public school and during the school days, so the kids were kind of a captive audience. Um, now, the context here is teen pregnancy is declining. This is a huge achievement of American policy. I don't think we have a whole answer, and we need better methods of figuring out there are a lot of factors here. One thing that I think is really important, parents, politicians, ministers, teachers, the teens themselves, we have very good data on this, they all say it's a bad idea for a teen to have a baby. So we have a tremendous agreement on the major value that underlines this whole uh, project, which is we should have less teen pregnancy. It's a bad idea. Young ladies and young men should do what they can to make sure they don't get pregnant. Everything from no sex to using appropriate birth control. And as you can see, we've been really successful. Every year except two since 1991, teen pregnancy rates have declined. And over the period, it declined 60%. There are hardly any other important social programs that we've had this kind of success. So the, all these programs that I'm going to describe to you right now uh, are occurring against the backdrop of these declining teen pregnancy rates. Okay, now here's the bad news. So you've got to concentrate here for just a minute. I should have done this right at the beginning because I see some of you might be blinking a little bit. And we should... I was once at a meeting at the Frank Porter Graham Child Development Center, and after about 45 minutes, one of the preschool teachers got up, and she was going to talk about the families, and she made everybody stand up and sing songs. <laughs> so here you have all these distinguished researchers standing up singing these, you know, kids' songs. It was amazing. Now woke them up. So everybody stand. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but I hope you will be awake for this, because now we're at the punchline. All right, so Tier 1, Tier 2. Tier 1 are all projects that are evidence-based. They follow the HHS procedure, and they officially determine that these are evidence-based programs. Tier 2 are promising programs, so they don't have the results of a high-quality, usually random assignment study, but they're promising. They have some indication that they may be good, so they're moving along this uh, production line that I've been talking about of having innovative programs that might work. Right, so there are 22 of those. And the valuations have met standards. The, the Office of Adolescent Health that I've talked about before studied each evaluation very carefully, and they determined whether the evaluation was a high-quality evaluation. So of the 19 projects, 12 had high-quality evaluations in Tier 1 and 16 in Tier 2. How many of these projects had at least one significant impact? All right? And the answer is four in Tier 1 and 8 in Tier 2. Well, this is somewhat disappointing, I will admit. So if you count the projects that had high-quality evaluations, it's only 
other programs had at least one significant impact on an outcome. I'll talk about what they were in just a minute. And 36% in Tier 2, which is, that's not what would be expected, because Tier 1, you're replicating evidence-based programs. And let me draw your attention. This is the essence of, of our project here, is we're going we're gonna to identify programs that produce impacts, and then you've got to show you can scale them up, that they'll replicate when they go to new sites. If that, doesn't, if that step doesn't work, this, pro this evidence-based movement is going to fail. So this is really a crucial thing, and as you can see here, we're, we've got a long ways to go. Uh, if you share all the evaluations, then 33% uh, uh, on Tier 1, I'm sorry, of the high-quality evaluations that met the standards, 33% were successful and 50% in Tier 2. So I'd say those are pretty good outcomes. Think back to the original slides I show you where 90% of the programs were shown to fail, um, and these numbers look a little better. They're a little bit disappointing, but they look better. So here are all the individual measures, and you can see most of them produce zero impact. But recent sexual activity had some impact, and sexual initiation or abstinence also had some impact. And then contraceptive use, which is really, that probably is the most important one except the pregnancy itself, because contraception is effective, especially IUDs, uh, are 100% effective virtually. And there are now all kinds of programs that help young 16, 17-year-old teenagers to get IUDs, so even if they have sex, they don't get pregnant. It's controversial, but it's, you know, it's, a, it's a very big deal. And only one of the Tier 1 projects of 14 was successful, but six of 18 Tier 2 projects uh, had a reduction, had an increase in contraception use uh, and, and or consistent use of contraception. And then if you go to the single most important outcome, which is pregnancy, one of four in Tier 1 and four of eight in Tier 2 produce impacts. So this is the state of the art. This is where we are. This is the evidence-based strategy and operation. We will have another evaluation next year, very similar to this on home visiting, the David Olds type. There, I think there are 15 or so home visiting programs that are considered to be evidence-based. We're going to have a huge study from programs all across the nation, just like teen pregnancy prevention, and we'll be able to look at it just like this. Hopefully, we'll have better results in here. But even if they're like this, they're somewhat encouraging. I mean, I think this is somewhat encouraging, and we can continue to improve. So what should we do? How can we improve these outcomes? And the first thing is we ought to raise the bar on the programs we consider to be evidence-based. We're too loose. There are too many evidence-based programs. So, for example, under the criteria that HHS uses, you could have invented a program 15 years ago, produce an impact on one outcome, and that's now an evidence-based program. I think that's a big mistake. And... It might be a fairly indirect thing, like some impact on sexual activity. It doesn't even necessarily have to have shown that it had an impact on the most, one of the most important outcomes, which is, uh, which is uh, birth control, use of birth control, or teen pregnancy itself. So we need to strengthen that. I think that's really important. If, if more of these programs had used strong evidence-based models, they would have, they, in all likelihood, would have been better. So we need better development and implementation of these evidence-based programs. We need to help communities to select better programs. Office of Adolescent Health tried to do some of that, but this is another unexplored area of how we need to help work with local communities to pick strong evidence-based programs and implement them with fidelity and yet be able to, uh, to adapt them to local circumstances. Uh, so in general, we need to know a lot more about how we implement these programs and we can improve those implementation of the programs and, and all likelihood produce better outcomes. So the bottom line here is we are spending billions of dollars on programs that do not have impacts. We're wasting a lot of money, and above all, we're wasting opportunities for social programs in the United States. We can do a much better job, and this general strategy of identifying evidence-based programs and scaling them up I think it's the most promising thing that we've done so far. It's already beginning to show some impacts, and we're going to improve year after year if we stick with it here. So I'm somewhat optimistic about the future, that we can develop good teen pregnancy prevention, good education programs, good preschool education programs, send kids to school um, more uh, ready for achievement, reduce uh, juvenile delinquency, we can produce a whole range of impacts if we will follow this strategy and implement it with precision and toughness.
Questions? So raise your hand and uh, tell us your name and ask a question. Uh, so my name is Dave Campbell. I'm a uh, political scientist, studies public policy, and has done a lot of evaluation of local implementation of, of federal policies, particularly workforce development policy. And uh, so it's hard to be against evidence but I am a skeptic of this movement of evidence-based policymaking uh, for a couple main reasons, and I think you've alluded to both of them in your uh, talk. I mean, one is that we tend to apply this to social programs in a way that we don't to defense policy programs, et cetera, et cetera. So maybe you can kind of speak to that differential in sort of how, when and how this gets used, which makes it hard to defend against the critique that this is just politics by other other means here. Okay, wait, let me, let's clarify that. Are you saying that we're using evidence-based, we want to have evidence-based policy and social programs so we can cut the social spending? Yeah. There are people who would like to do that, and I'm afraid Mulvaney could be one of them. He certainly, he actually said that. I've already mentioned this to you. So that is a great danger. But it certainly was not a problem during the Bush administration. It was not a problem during the Obama administration. So the, uh, this could change dramatically from administration to administration. Now, I'm not a defense expert. I work with several at Brookings who are experts. And they say that there are rigorous evaluations of many defense programs, and many of them have been changed. But we're all familiar that there are examples that are just outrageous, where they spend a lot of money on a new airplane, for example. A, a huge cost overruns and that sort of thing. So there is, I think you're right, I think the force of the question is right, uh, but that certainly is no reason to stop focusing on how to improve the social programs. So the second second part, it has to do with the program as a unit of analysis. So a lot of what we find in our studies is that uh, for a poor person, in a community, they're interacting with a wide range of social programs at any given time or over the course of their life. And a lot of what really seems to make the difference is not so much any individual program per se, but the ability to navigate the network of programs that's out there. A lot of that has to do with kind of right. relationships that they are able to build or not build with frontline staff and, right. and how that works out. It seems to me and this is where I hope you can correct me, that the evidence-based policy approach and randomized controlled tr trials doesn't really speak to that level of things. I and, think and, there's truth yeah. in that, uh, but there also are a number of unique programs that in and of themselves are designed to produce impacts and have been shown to be able to produce impacts. In fact, I would modify your question a little bit to point out that I think it's so difficult to produce these changes in human behavior and uh, among kids, that we what we're going to have to go to is a model in which we have consecutive programs over time. Now, it's true, simultaneous programs or at the same moment could pr produce an impact, but I don't think we're ever going to have anything like an inoculation that one program takes care of the problem forever. We're going to have to have multiple programs if we're really serious about the development of poor kids and about doing something about income equality in the United States, because we now have abundant data to show it's a huge problem and it's not getting better. And very few of the things we thought of are produced. So it's going to take stuff starting in preschool years, better education. We have a lot of good evidence-based reading programs, for example. Import teen pregnancy during the teenage years, that will really set back, and guys too. Uh, so a whole series of programs like that, and under those circumstances, I think evidence can play a very important role. That's not, however, to deny that we don't have a good way to evaluate the impacts of a whole s a set of programs. Next question over here. Hi, I'm Justin Wiltshire. I'm a second year PhD economics student. Uh, thank you very much for that talk and for the important work you do. Um, I'm inclined to, uh, to really value evidence-based policymaking. I had a, a conversation recently where it was put to me, and I, 
I couldn't quite really say, no, I disagree with you on that. Um, it, it was suggested that focusing so much on evidence-based policymaking really takes, uh, takes the ability to evaluate programs out of the hands of the masses. It's undemocratic. It puts that ability in the hands of a few experts, and most people will not be able to understand really what's going on. They just have to accept it. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. I think there's some truth in that. Uh, there's always a danger. In fact, someone asked me earlier today, should we have mandatory requirements for these various programs and tell the states how they have to do it? I'm very leery about that. I think we need to persuade them to do it. Uh, we could give them some money that's where there are mandatory requirements like that, but it's not necessarily a good uh, general approach. Program managers have learned a tremendous amount about evaluation. It's, even if they start where they don't understand the importance of it. And that's why I say that's why we can't use it as a way to, as a weapon to stop spending on these programs. We've got to give them multiple chances to improve. And then I think they will be able to improve. They'll understand the impacts of evaluation. It isn't just experts that do it. And a lot of them are willing to work with local universities who actually conduct the evaluations. We have a lot of capacity to do this kind of thing in local universities. So I think there's a there is a more optimistic story here that we can use resources from the federal level to the state level to the local level, and program managers will be a, an important part of it. Yes, right here. Hi, I'm, is that on? I'm Alan Olmstead, and I used to be in the economics department. Um, I remember 50, 55 years ago, not that I'm that old, but I... <laughs> Someone told you. There was a big rage about doing cost-benefit studies yeah. on all kinds of things, and I'm thinking of Walter Heller and people like that coming into the console and so forth. Is this in any sense materially different from the goals and even the techniques of doing it? I, I realize you, you, we know a lot more about surveys and random samples and so forth. Secondly, in... Wait a minute, let me do one at a time, because yeah, I don't okay. remember the, them. It's, it's, um, it's the same area. I, I, think it's, I think it's different in this sense. Benefit-cost studies depend on impacts on outcomes. That's the basic ingredient of a benefit-cost study, is you produce an impact. If there's no impacts, you, you don't need to worry about benefit-cost study. So we're focusing on how to measure these impacts and how to make sure that they have been reliably produced. That's why random assignment is such an important part of it. And so I think it's a more fundamental approach. Now, if the implication here is that this is going to go the way of uh, cost-benefit studies, which are, to some ways of thinking, less popular than they used to be, it's possible. I mean, I've said that from the very beginning. I'm optimistic, but this too could pass, uh, and we'll have lost a potentially one of the best tools that we can employ. It isn't clear that we can build programs you know, re replicate programs and build up. I mean, think about this. We're going to have to have a thousand, five thousand programs that all of which produce impacts. And you look at that table I told you, it's possible that we're not going to be able to do that. So there's a lot to be learned here. It's, I think it's promising. I think the logic works. But we'll have to see if we can actually do it. I, I'm not disagreeing with you, and I'm not saying it's going to go the way of cost-benefit studies. I'm saying there was a parallel movement, mm -hmm. and maybe there's something to be learned yeah. from it. And let me just add one thing. Cost-benefit studies are very much a part of this movement. I, 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 I just for sake of simplicity left it Two of the problems that they ran into and were quite controversial was the internal discount rates that you didn't mention and how you apply that to various kinds mm -hmm. of studies. And then there were always people on all kinds of things saying, well, it's not taking in the broader values to society, you know, the beauty of a national park or something right. like that. And you yeah. can have those kinds of Im immeasurables uh, coming That may here. be true, but I absolutely guarantee you, if we can produce programs that reduce teen pregnancy, that increase school preparation, that increase reading scores, the American public will go with it, and so will politicians. And there these big questions about should we spend the money on parks instead of on you know, these other programs will still be out there, but we'll maintain these programs and spend more on them, and they will produce bigger impacts if we can learn how to do it.
So on that note, there are two programs, food stamps and also um, um, trying to moderate uh, criminal justice sentencing practices that seem to have a lot of research behind them as to their um, potential effectiveness or promise for producing better outcomes, lower crime with less spending on prisons and better outcomes for young students who are in families that receive food stamps. Why, why are we having trouble getting whoever it is, Congress, uh, the, the American people who are voting for um, these people or, or not, wh why is it hard to get this, these ideas disseminated in a way that people do adopt evidence-based policy when we have the evidence? Well, the data is that your question is misplaced because we're spending so much more. The food stamp program has grown by leaps and bounds. It covers way more people than it has in the past. The benefits are quite generous. The penetration rate of the program, where the denominator is the number of eligibles, the numerator is the number of people who get the benefit, has increased dramatically over the last 20 years. So somebody out there is recognizing uh, that it's a good program, and Republicans have supported it. Now, they, they're threatening to cut it, but I don't think that's an evidence-based decision. It's also welfare. Okay, well, that isn't what you ask. A lot of people do recognize an important program, and that it produces good impacts on kids. In fact, we have some really remarkable studies. But look, we haven't talked about this at all. Here's a very important point. It will never be the case that evidence is going to determine policy outcomes. You still have to fight against party views and party philosophy. Republicans are never going to like welfare. They're, they will be happy, only too happy, to cut spending programs like they're trying to do right now, including Medicaid that has also has very clear benefits. So it's never going to be totally dominant. But it can be a more important element. And I've heard a lot of people say, if we just had a, a seat at the table and make decisions based on evidence, we can improve social programs, we could have more successful social programs, and many of them would grow. So it's not ideal. It's never going to be the final absolute solution, but it will improve social policy. All the way in the back. Hi, my name is Ethan Evans. I'm a sociologist at the Center for Health Policy and Research. And I have a bunch of thoughts that come to mind of like kink points where there could be problems both in for the service providers that do these services, try to do the evaluations. But I'm wondering what you see are the kink points where this approach, because I hear you really standing on the approach of doing this for evaluating the types of programs we do. Is it where, who decides which outcomes are the most important for any given area? Is it the areas that we apply it to? I mean, I wonder why this isn't done more in healthcare. That seems to be a touchy subject with doctors who are concerned about their relationship and the patients as well. So I ask you, like, what are the kink points where this process starts to get pushed away? You know? It starts with the legislation, I think. All, every program that I talked about, it starts with legislation, that there are requirements in the statute, that the program has to be evaluated. In some cases, it even uses terms like using random assignment where possible. And in some cases, like the home visiting program, it even specifies the outcomes that are so the legislation would decide in a democratic process. And I would expect that to continue, that there will be requirements for evaluation, and they'll leave a lot up to the agencies and the development of what I have re referred to as a culture over time. And states can have an input to this. States are the ones that really implement most of these programs. So there are multiple answers, but the answer to your question is it starts with the legislation. Yes. Oh, she's going to go back there. Now we know who's really in charge. Uh, go ahead. Daniela Orniso, and my question is in regard to funding. Um, so you mentioned competitive versus formula-based funding. Yeah. Many will argue that taking away the formula-based funding would take away funding from very need-based communities. Um, so I just want to hear your comments on that. I think that's true. Uh, and so I would not end, totally end need-based funding, but if we're going to have evidence-based policy, I'm not, I mean, right now I told you Peter Orzag's 1%, so we're a long ways from ending 
uh, formula-based funding. We'll need both, but we need a lot more evidence-based policy that can have impacts and produce the same changes that we're looking for in formulas to try to make sure communities that are, have a lot of need get a lot of services. But if those services are not effective, you know, we need a way to develop more effective services and programs. And so I think we're so far away from any kind of balance between the two that you can five years from now, ten years from now, maybe your program, maybe your question would concern me a little bit more, but right now I'm not very concerned about it. Although I do agree there ought to be formula-based funding. You didn't mention, but you could have, that a lot of these communities that are really poor, they can't write good grants. This has been discovered many times in the past, so you need to help them write the grants and so forth. But as I say, we're still so, we still have so much formula-based funding that we're in no danger of drying up the resources for communities. Hi, Leah Hibble, um, Associate Professor in Human Development. So um, I really appreciate your talk. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Thank you. I felt like in the, the beginning of your talk, you were a little bit dismissive of the current administration's effect on um, this train that seems to be in motion already. Um, Wait a minute. I, I didn't mean to be dismissive. Uh, I don't think we know yet. There, I made it clear that I would not be willing to say Trump is going to undermine this. Right. We don't know that he's going to do that. He's been indifferent, I think. Right, so Mulvaney, on the other hand, seems to be at odds with at least part of the evidence-based movement. And there's nothing, I talk to people at OMB every day, and there's nothing like the, you know, the push from the top that evidence is really crucial and we need to build the evidence movement. Now, maybe they'll get to that. They're trying to cut spending now. They think the number one thing is to balance the budget, and there's good justification for feeling that way. So... I don't know. We'll see what happens. But I did not mean to dismiss him. I, I, I apologize. Okay. No, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, though, if you can bridge that with uh, maybe current efforts to undermine basic research um, and how the, the funding for NIH, NSF, Department of Ed, which, uh, you know, if we want good evidence-based policy, the foundation needs to be in basic research. Yep. And so okay, how so the answer happen. is yes. I'm really worried about that. As you know, the uh, Trump administration recommended cutting, I think it was $2 billion out of NIH. Um, and they got in a situation where the conservatives wanted more, so they wouldn't support the bill. So what did that mean? We call uh, this is the Boehner solution. The Republicans in the House had to reach out to Democrats, and Democrats were ready for that. And the Democrats convinced Republicans to spend $5 billion more on the 2017 budget. There are only five months left, so a billion dollars a month that the Democrats squeeze Republicans for. And there's every reason to think exactly the same thing will happen with the 2018 budget. So Trump's budget comes out. It has no force of law or anything. It can be totally ignored on the Hill, and often is. And it's not usually ignored when the president and control of the Hill are in the same party. But I think Republicans have already shown they are not afraid of being independent of the president, and they've really changed his priorities in the 2017 budget and overrode them and spent way more than he intended, including the NIH. So I think it's a concern, and I think the real test is coming now with the 2018 budget. I, if I had to bet money, I would say the same thing will happen. The, the Freedom Caucus will not vote with other Republicans because they won't be satisfied with how much money is being saved, and Republicans will have to cut a deal with Democrats, and a lot of that money will be restored. I think that's what will happen. But boy, there's plenty of reason to be concerned that it wouldn't. Um, I'll tell you an experience I recently had. I got a real kick out of this. The, the chair of the Appropriations Committee in the House sent a letter to the National Science Foundation, and basically, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but basically said, why should we spend money on the National Science Foundation? So the National Science Foundation went to the National Academies, which is a spectacular organization, and usually produces reports that take about three years and have about 800 pages with all kinds of appendixes and everything. You drop it on your toe, you're in bad shape. The National Academies agreed to write a report in less than a month. I think it's the shortest they've ever done it. I was fortunate to be on the committee and watch it in operation, and they we wrote a really fascinating report about 
basic science leading to all kinds of great things. I'll give you one example that I'm still astounded by. I never had any idea of this. Altitude. Who would study altitude? And yet we have scientists who study altitude. It turned out that there were a number of businesses that really were extremely interested in their research, biscuit companies and cracker companies, because things decay at, at different rates depending on altitude, so they need to wrap their stuff differently at different altitudes. Same thing with chips. They're, I forget exactly what it is about chips, but the altitude has an impact on how the chips function. So we have, this report is full of examples like that. A lot of interiorism. Here's another one. Oh, you'll love this. Everybody recommends if, a, if, a, if there's a terrorist attack that's imminent, run. Okay, guess what happens? The bomb goes off. If people are crowded around, the inner group, say first five, six, seven, eight rows, depends on the bomb, really get the blast. But they absorb the blast. And the other people are saved by the people that were on the inside. There's a lot of research on this. So the best thing to do is just tell them stand there and help your friends, you know. Don't run. That's the worst thing you do because it spreads people out and then the shrapnel hits more people. So there are a zillion examples like that where research really makes a big difference. Okay, well, let's do one more. This last question. Make it a good one. Thank you. Well, I'm Paul Lee. I'm from Public Health. I'm just wondering, what are your favorite programs that you think, if you had enough money to spend, you mentioned the teen pregnancy, what do you think about Head Start or some of the others? If you, if you had money to spend, let's say, in four or five programs, most effective, where would you spend that money? Okay, let me answer about Head Start first. We just did a study. Listen to this. We, there have been a lot of claims about pre-K education. 41 states have pre-K programs, uh, and the, a number of them have been carefully evaluated. So we put together a group at Brookings of the greatest experts in the field, Greg Duncan, uh, Deborah Phillips, Mark Lipsy, really the best experts that have not only know the literature but have actually conducted studies. And after the whole goal was to have consensus statements that we could make public so the press and policymakers could understand the status of the science on this is state pre-K, scaled up state pre-K. First conclusion is that there are big impacts at the end of the program. Virtually every study that was well done shows big impacts at the end of the program. But long-term impacts, defined as third grade or further, the results are all over the place. So anybody who makes claims about the long-term impacts of state pre k and some of you are not going to like this, but you cannot legitimately m make claims about the long run long-term impacts, because the studies are all over the place. Some of them show big impacts, some of them show negative impacts, and, and many produce, the majority probably produce no findings. So Head Start is, would be kind of in that group. This does not include Head Start, but I think that's what we know about Head Start, too. It's based on one, primarily on one national study. So, but I'm still convinced. I was part of the Absidarian Project, which is one of the premier preschool programs that produced astounding impacts in the long run. So it's possible. But we're not there yet. And I think, again, what I've been saying about evidence-based policy, we have to develop effective preschool programs, starting early, pre-K, just the one year, like the state pre-K programs are now. And we can improve those programs, and we could produce long-term impacts that have much broader impacts and that last longer. But we're not there yet. What? I want to keep spending on pre-K. I think it's so crucial, and I think I think we're we already know a lot. We're learning more, and I think five years, ten years from now, we'll have much more effective programs. So I'm quite happy. But you don't have to make a choice between one or two things. I mean, we spend hundreds of billions of dollars. We can spend a lot of money on a lot of different programs. The key is to improve them. That's what we need. We need a strategy for improving them, and that's what I've been trying to tell you today that I think evidence-based policy is the best way to do it. And that ends the discussion. Thank you all for coming.